A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 26th of July 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. Look at this article from the editorial page. Recently, the Rajasthan Assembly passed a bill on July 24, 2023, which is the Rajasthan Platform Based Gig Workers Registration and Welfare Bill 2023. By passing this bill, now Rajasthan has become the first state in the country to pass a bill for the welfare of gig workers earning their livelihood through online platforms. So, the author of this article speaks about gig economy. By keeping this bill in mind so in this news article discussion let us try to understand some of the important points mentioned in the news article before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it first the author explains about the gig economy so what is gig economy see the gig economy refers to a working arrangement where individuals work on short term and they perform contract based tasks without any traditional employer employee relationships companies use platforms and apps to connect consumers with workers like how zomato and swiggy connect delivery partners with customers now this setup allows employers to evade responsibilities employers often do not provide fair wages proper working conditions and social security benefits to these gig workers according to the author this happens because of the exploitative nature of the gig economy firstly the article highlights that gig workers like those driving for uber or ola are often treated as partners actually they should be referred to as employees right by this way Companies try to get rid of their responsibilities towards the well-being of these so-called partners. The platform operators take a substantial commission. They control various aspects of the job through algorithms. So, they can easily block a worker's access to the job. This leaves these workers without any job security. As a result of all these, the gig workers face many challenges. Apart from this, the gig workers have limited bargaining power and they face difficulties in forming effective unions due to the nature of their work. Many gig workers are left without social security benefits which are essential for dealing with emergencies like illnesses or old age. To address all these challenges only, the Rajasthan government passed this new bill for gig workers. Now the author of this article appreciates the Rajasthan bill and talks about its importance. And if you have to appreciate the bill, you should know about this bill in the first place. So let me give you a brief on the Rajasthan platform based gig workers registration and welfare bill 2023. See the primary objective of this bill is to provide legal recognition and social security benefits to gig workers operating in the state of Rajasthan. It aims to create a formal system for the registration of gig workers and aggregators and it also seeks to establish a welfare board to oversee their rights and welfare. Hope you got the essence of the bill. Now what are the key provisions of the bill? See, firstly, the bill mandates the registration of all gig workers and aggregators who are operating within the state of Rajasthan. This registration process is crucial for bringing gig work into the formal economy. Then the second main component of the bill is the creation of the Rajasthan platform based gig workers welfare board. This board will be responsible for overseeing the welfare and rights of gig workers in the state. It will consist of two representatives from gig workers two representatives from aggregators and two civil servants. See, the welfare board will play a crucial role in guaranteeing social security benefits to gig workers. This may include benefits like accident and health insurance, disability benefits, maternity benefits and other forms of social security. These are the benefits that regular employees receive from any employer. Thirdly, the gig workers will be registered under a comprehensive database created by the government. Each gig worker will be assigned a unique ID. This will serve as an identifier for them within the 
formal system so these are all some of the important provisions of the rajasthan law talking about the benefits offered by the bill to the gig workers firstly the gig workers will be officially recognized and protected under the law this gives them access to various legal rights and benefits secondly the gig workers will have access to social security benefits this provides them with financial protection during times of need or crisis thirdly the welfare board ensures that gig workers have a platform to address any grievances they have this ensures fair treatment and protection of their rights it also promotes inclusivity and ensures that they are not left vulnerable to exploitation now you should understand why the author prizes the rajasthan law as a significant breakthrough for gig workers the author also talks about something called the hamal model see the hamal panchayat union was formed more than 60 years ago in maharashtra the hamals were laborers who carried sacks for merchants but they lacked basic rights and benefits so to address this they fought and won a law that set up a matadi board this board registered both workers and merchants and it ensured that merchants deposited workers wages and a levy for social security with the board it also facilitated access to benefits like gratuity health and education benefits The Rajasthan law is inspired from the Hamal model. It applies the principles of this Hamal model to the gig economy. It requires all aggregators and workers to be registered with the board. A fee will be levied on each transactions on the platform and this fee will fund the social security fund. for gig workers the board becomes an important grievance redressal mechanism and provides transparency in transactions see note this point it is a very good case study to write in your essay answer writing coming back now what are the implications of the rajasthan law see the rajasthan law is a significant step forward in providing fair work and social security to gig workers it sets up precedent for several laws in other parts of the world so in essence The Rajasthan Platform Based Gig Workers Act is an important milestone in safeguarding the rights of gig workers. It paves the way for a more just and equitable future for workers in the digital era. Hope similar laws gets implemented in other states as well or it is fine to have a national framework to uniformly implement this in all states. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we briefly saw about what is gig economy. Then we saw what are the challenges faced by them. Then we saw about the key provisions of the bill. Finally, we ended with the implications of the Rajasthan law. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this front page article. See, recently, 26 opposition parties from across India have united to create the India Alliance. India stands for the Indian National Developmental Inclusive Alliance. The main objective of this alliance is to challenge the ruling National Democratic Alliance (NDA) led by the BJP in the upcoming 2024 Lok Sabha election. This alliance is now planning to move a no confidence motion against the Narendra Modi government in the Lok Sabha. The motion aims to force the Prime Minister to address the ongoing unrest in Manipur. In this context, let us learn two important concepts: no confidence motion and stress motion or flow test. First let us take up the no conference motion see a no conference motion is a parliamentary procedure used by the opposition to express lack of confidence in the ruling government it is moved when the opposition believes that the government does not have the majority support in the lower house of the parliament that is lok sabha the purpose of a no confidence motion is to test the government's strength mainly it is used to force the government to prove its majority now what is the procedure to move a no confidence motion see any member of the lok sabha can move a no confidence motion the member needs to give a written notice of the motion to the speaker of the lok sabha the speaker reads out the notice and if at least 50 members support the motion the speaker announces the date for the discussion on the motion now the discussion takes place 10 days after the motion is accepted during the discussion the government has to defend its policies and prove that it still enjoys the majority support in the house 
if 51 percentage of the members of the house vote in favor of the no confidence motion it is passed now the government is deemed to have lost the majority and has to resign from office that is if the government fails to prove its majority during the vote it must resign from office this is the no confidence motion now what is trust vote or floor test see a trust vote is also known as floor test or motion of confidence it is just the opposite of a no confidence motion basically it is a procedure for the government to demonstrate its majority in the lok sabha the prime minister who leads the ruling government usually proposes the motion of confidence now what are the occasions for a trust vote to be taken firstly when a new government is formed after a general election the person who is selected as the prime minister seeks a trust vote he or she does this to prove their majority in the lok sabha secondly when a government loses its majority due to the withdrawal of support by coalition partners or due to defections see more often a government is formed by a coalition of different political parties they work together to run the country sometimes one or more parties in the coalition may decide that they will not support the government because of any disagreement when this happens the ruling government may lose its majority so in this case it can choose to seek a trust vote so that they can regain the legitimacy and support third in some cases a trust vote may be used as a strategic move by the government this is done to consolidate its position and secure public support for important policies or decisions now what are the procedure for a trust vote see firstly the prime minister moves the motion of confidence in the lok sabha then the government must demonstrate its majority during its session on the motion now the members of the parliament that is mps vote on the motion if the government secures a majority of votes it retains power and continues to govern on the other hand if the government fails to obtain the required majority it may either resign or face a no confidence motion moved by the opposition so these are the two important difference between no confidence motion and a confidence motion or trust vote or floor test now these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article See, according to the news article, yesterday Lok Sabha passed the Biological Diversity Amendment Bill 2021. The bill aims to amend the Biological Diversity Act 2002. So, in this news article discussion, we shall see some of the important changes brought about by the amendment bill. Firstly, let us see briefly about the Biological Diversity Act 2002. See, the act was enacted. to realize the objectives of the united nations convention on biological diversity in short called as cbd 1992 the main objective of the 2002 act is conservation of biological diversity in india and their sustainable use the act also aims to ensure fair and equitable sharing of the benefits that arise from using biodiversity The act also led to the establishment of National Biodiversity Authority (NBA) at the apex level, then State Biodiversity Board (SBB) at provincial level, and Biodiversity Management Committee (BMC) at the local bodies level. Even though the act led to the establishment of these bodies, they also had some issues. For example, traditional Indian medicine practitioners. the seed sector industry and researchers raised complaints about the act as it imposed a heavy complaints burden on them also it has been 20 years since the act was enacted a lot of changes have happened since then and this is why our government decided to amend the act now let us quickly see the changes brought about by the amendment see the first changes regarding approval The BDA Act 2002 makes sure before obtaining biological resources or associated knowledge in India prior approval or intimation should be made to the regulatory authority here the regulatory authority or nothing but the NDA and the SBB according to the 2002 act four entities have to get approval from the NBA such entities includes foreign individuals non resident indians companies not registered in india and companies registered in india and having non indian participation in share capital or management 
See, the amendment bill makes changes to the last entity alone. It is changed to companies registered in India which are foreign controlled companies as under the Companies Act 2013. Also remember, according to the 2002 Act, the entities mentioned here have to get approval from the NBA. Likewise, the entities like Indian citizens and companies registered in India should get approval from the SBB before biological resources and associated knowledge for commercial utilization. The 2002 Act also provides exemptions for certain entities. These entities need not get approval from either NBA or SBB. Such entities include local people and community, cultivators of biological diversity and people who practice indigenous medicines. The amendment bill adds certain entities to the exception list. The entities include codified traditional knowledge practitioners and Ayush practitioners. So in addition to local people, cultivators and people who participate in indigenous medicines, these entities are also exempted from getting approval from the SBB. In addition to this, when any entity uses biological resources from cultivated medicinal plants, that is the one which does not occur naturally, they are also exempted from receiving approval from NBA or SBB according to the amendment bill. So these are all some of the important changes brought about by the bill regarding to approvals. Now the second change is regarding intellectual property rights IPR. See according to the 2002 act all entities either foreign or India need to seek the approval of NBA before an application is made for a patent. That is only if the NBA approves an application for a patent can be filed. The amendment bill changes in this regard. According to the new bill there is no need to seek approval before the application of the patent but approval must be received before the grant of the patent. In addition to this, the amendment bill makes a distinction between foreign and domestic entities. The foreign entities need to get the approval of the NBA before the grant of the patent but domestic entities need not get approval from the NBA for getting a patent but they must get themselves registered with the NBA. So now it is enough for the domestic entities to get the approval of the NBA before commercialization of the patent. Okay, these are the changes brought about by the amendment regarding to IPR. Now the third change is regarding benefit sharing. Here benefit sharing refers to requiring applicants especially the commercial entities to share monetary and non-monetary benefits with creators or holders of associated traditional knowledge and local people. The 2002 Act makes benefit sharing provisions applicable to research, commercial utilization as well as biosurvey and biotilization for certain entities. The amendment bill removes the applicability benefit sharing from research and biosurvey and biotilization. So only commercial utilization benefit sharing is applicable. Then according to 2002 Act, the terms of benefit sharing are determined by the NBA for all entities. The amendment bill makes a distinction between foreign and domestic entities. According to the amendment bill for the domestic entities, the SBB will determine the benefit sharing based on the guidelines set out by the NBA. Then the amendment also makes changes in regards to the parties involved in framing the benefit sharing agreement. According to the 2002 Act, the benefit sharing should be in accordance with the mutually agreed terms and conditions between the applicant, that is the commercial entity, then the local bodies concerned and the benefit climbers, that is the local people. But according to the new amendment bill, the terms should be in accordance with the mutually agreed terms between the applicant and the Biodiversity Management Committee BMC, that is the district level body represented by the NBA. So these are all the changes brought about by the amendment bill in regard to benefit sharing. Finally, the amendment made changes in regards to offenses and penalties. According to the 2002 Act, offenses like failing to get approval or failing to provide prior information were punished with imprisonment of up to five years or a fine or both. But the amendment bill removes jail term and in its place awards a penalty ranging between 1 lakh rupees and 50 lakh rupees. And these penalties are provided by an adjudicating officers of the rank of joint secretary of the central government or the rank of secretary of the state government. These are all some of the 
notable changes brought about by the biological diversity amendment bill 2021 make note of all these points you can use it in your main answer writing so in this news article we saw about four important changes brought by the amendment bill first is regarding the approval second is regarding the intellectual property rights ipr third is regarding benefit sharing and finally we saw about the changes regarding offenses and penalties with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this editorial article this article is speaking about the importance of circular economy and resource efficiency currently it is in news because india has prioritized resource efficiency and circular economy as one of the three core themes for discussion in the g20 forum this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us learn few points about circular economy and resource efficiency which may news today the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here you can pause the video and go through it Firstly what is this circular economy and resource efficiency see circular economy refers to the sustainable economic model that focuses on reusing and recycling of existing materials rather than using new or virgin materials for example let us say a construction company is in need of steel for its new apartment project imagine the construction company already has some steel but it is too old and rusted Now if the company gets new steel from the market the old steel will be accumulated as a waste right here comes the circular economy see if the company recycles and reuses the unused old steel it will reduce the use of new steel and avoid the accumulation of waste this is what the circular economy actually means it helps us to reduce the consumption of fresh natural resources and avoid the creation of waste now what does the term resource efficiency mean resource efficiency refers to the sustainable and effective use of earth's limited natural resources while minimizing impacts on the environment remanufacturing repair maintenance recycling and eco design are some of the examples of resource efficiency according to india Resource efficiency and circular economy are the two powerful strategies that can effectively minimize the dependence on natural resources. Since India is currently working hard to achieve the sustainable development goals, India has prioritized resource efficiency and circular economy in the G20 forum. Now talking about India's priority areas, see India is focusing on four priority areas. for the circular economy during its g20 presidency first is circularity in the steel sector secondly extended producer responsibility epr thirdly circular bioeconomy and finally establishing an industry led resource efficiency and circular economy now we shall understand about these priority sectors one by one firstly let us take the circularity in steel sector See most of the G20 member countries have committed to achieve net zero emissions. For example, India has set a target to achieve net zero emission by 2070. To achieve the target of net zero emissions, most of the G20 member nations are working to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. One of the way to mitigate greenhouse gas emission is this circularity in the steel sector. Here you might have a doubt. Why is the focus given to steel sector? See some studies have pointed out that about 7% of global greenhouse gas emission comes from iron and steel production. Apart from this there is also a growing demand for steel especially in developing countries like India. So to tackle steel sector emissions there needs to be a transition towards a circular steel sector. This means that the waste steel generated during the production process or the unused old steel can be reused or recycled. This would help to reduce the greenhouse gas emission that arises from iron and steel production. But in order to meet this goal, G20 member countries should ensure collaboration in the aspects of knowledge sharing, technology co-development and technology transfer. Currently, India has released the presidency document for knowledge exchange on the circular economy in steel sector this document can act as a potential blueprint for net zero emission in the steel industry by reducing resource utilization and minimizing wastage this is about the first key area that is the circularity in steel sector now the second priority area is nothing but the extended producer responsibility see epr is a policy framework that encourages the manufacturers to design environment friendly products 
basically epr attempts to move the burden of waste management away from consumers and government and it places the burden back into the hands of the manufacturers thereby it encourages manufacturers to design less wasteful less harmful and less toxic products because at the end they are only responsible for the waste they produce in the g20 forum india emphasized the significance of integrating the epr framework see different countries have implemented different epr models so india has advised the g20 member countries to share their best practices in the epr framework apart from this india has also stressed for effective implementation of epr to promote the growth of the recycling infrastructure and waste collection system this is about the second priority area now the third priority area is regarding the circular bioeconomy See a circular bioeconomy is an economy powered by nature. It is a new economic model that emphasizes the use of renewable natural capital and focuses on minimizing waste, replacing the wide range of non-renewable fossil based products currently in use. India adopted many measures to implement the circular bioeconomy for example India has been working towards the adoption of biofuels India has announced the Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Yojana this particular scheme aims to provide financial support to set up second generation ethanol projects in addition to this India has also launched the Gobar Dhan scheme This scheme aims to convert cattle dung and other organic waste into compost biogas and biofuels this promotes sustainable agriculture and also reduces pollution apart from this the indian government has also launched the sustainable alternative towards affordable transportation in short called as satat scheme this scheme promotes the use of compressed biogas as an alternative green transportation fuel so this also helps in the circular bioeconomy approach overall india has set up many examples for the circular bioeconomy so india can use these examples in the g20 forum to persuade the member countries to follow a circular bioeconomy approach now coming to the final priority area this is regarding the establishment of industry led resource efficiency and circular economy see industries are crucial in advancing resource efficiency and circular economy practices this is why india has envisioned an industry coalition in the areas of resource efficiency and circular economy the main idea behind this industrial coalition is that it aims to achieve enhanced technological collaboration in the fields of resource efficiency these are all the four priority areas so to conclude global platforms like g20 plays an important role in addressing key climate issues apart from this the g20 forum also presents various solutions to address the climate related disasters one such solution is the adoption of resource efficiency and circular economy just now we saw various factors about resource efficiency and the circular economy we hope such approaches will provide promising pathways towards a more sustainable and resilient future that's all regarding this news article With these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article yesterday the union finance ministry informed the rajya sabha that the central board of indirect taxes and customs that is the cbic has detected gst evasion of about 11000 crore rupees apart from this the cbic has also identified more than 9300 fake gst registrations see this mishap was identified after a special compliance drive conducted by the cbic in the past 2 months this is about the news article given here so in this news article discussion we shall understand few points about central board of indirect taxes and customs from exam perspective first of all know that in 1964 the erstwhile central board of revenue was split into two bodies like the central board of direct taxes cbdt and the central board of excise and customs cbec later in 2018 cbec was renamed as the central board of indirect taxes and customs the name got changed after the implementation of the goods and services tax now talking about cbic see cbic was established under the central boards of 
Revenue Act 1963. So it is a statutory body. The CBIC functions under the Department of Revenue of the Union Ministry of Finance. Talking about its composition, the CBIC consists of a chairman and six other members. Basically, the chairman is the senior most Indian Revenue Service, that is IRS officer of customs and indirect taxes. Note that the chairman is appointed by the appointments committee of the union cabinet. Now coming to the members, see there are totally six other members. they are responsible for six various roles like investigation customs it legal and compliance verification administration and vigilance tax policy and finally gst or central excise this is about the composition talking about the functions of cbic firstly the cbic is responsible for the policy formulation relating to levy and collection of indirect taxes like custom duty central excise duty central gst and integrated gst secondly the cbic exercises overall supervision over customs and central gst field units located across the country thirdly the cbic is tasked with collection of various customs duties like duty on land customs stations duty on inland container depots duty on special economic zones and duty on container freight stations apart from this the cbic also collects custom duties on international airports seaports custom houses and international air cargo stations and finally the cbic works towards the prevention of smuggling through international airports sea land custom stations and border checkpoints these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about cbic so with these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion this question is about the new biological diversity amendment bill 2021 four statements are given you have to choose how many statements given here are correct first statement says for accessing biological resources foreign entities need approval from the nba while the domestic entities need approval from the sbb second statement says benefit sharing applicable only for commercial utilization of biological resources third statement says offenses like failing to get approval or failing to provide prior information is now punishable with an financial penalty fourth statement says domestic entities need to get approval from the nba only before the commercialization of the patent so here all the statements given here are correct these are exactly the amendments made to the biodiversity act 2002 so the correct answer here is option d all the four now moving on this question is about central board of indirect taxes and customs cbic statement 1 says it is a constitutional body since so this statement is actually incorrect cbic was established under the central boards of revenue act 1963 so it is a statutory body not a constitutional body now the statement 2 says it is responsible for the policy formulation regarding the levy and collection of indirect taxes this statement is actually correct now the third statement says it works towards the prevention of smuggling through sea and international airports this statement is also correct so here the correct answer for the question is option b only two only the second and third statements are correct here now the questions displayed here are the mains practice questions for you today just go through the questions try to answer it in the comment section with this we came to the end of this news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ias academy youtube channel now thank you for listening